Welcome to the course Introduction to Advanced Cognitive Processes. I am Dr. Ark Verma from IIT Kanpur and we are in the seventh week of the course. We have been talking about cognition and emotion uh, in this week and this is the third lecture in the series. Let us continue our discussion about various effects on cognition, uh, various effects of emotions and mood states on different aspects of cognition. We have talked in this week already about uh, effects on attention and memory. Uh, we have also talked uh, in this week about say for example, how can, uh, be, uh, how can different kind of emotional states affect encoding and uh, how well or how much you recall this information. In the last lecture, we also talked a little bit about the amygdala and how the amygdala is important in uh, processing emotions and how does the amygdala actually uh, get involved in both at the time of learning and at the time of recall of uh, emotionally relevant information. So, let us continue this. Uh, in uh, today's lecture, I will uh, start talking a little bit about uh, the effects of uh, mood or emotional state on uh, the factors of judgment and decision making. Now, decision making and we have done this chapter on decision making uh, weeks ago. And so, decision making as you all know uh, involves choosing among different alternatives. So, you are presented with so many different alternatives and you have to choose which one of the uh, you know alternatives is most correct for you, you know the maximum utility or say for example, what makes sense at that point in time and there are different uh, you know possible reasons uh, that you would make these choices. So, one of the things, one of the reasons we uh, make choices because of is uh, one of the because we are kind of judging the likelihood of these various kinds of events that might occur and then we judge how will we feel. Well, if you are given a choice between you know uh, buying two sets of clothes or say for example, there are two bikes that you uh, want to choose from or say for example, there are a couple of people you are kind of you know you want to choose from that okay, uh, whom uh, uh, who will make me uh, feel happier if I were married to this person or something like that. So, the idea is we are constantly making these judgments, we are constantly trying to predict the future, we are constantly trying to not only predict future events, but more importantly we are constantly trying to predict how will we feel if those events were to occur. That is the that is basically the core of the discussion today. Uh, we will try and see what happens if people predict that if this happens and I will be happy, should I make this choice or on the other hand, if this happens, I think I will be sad, I do not want to lose money, I do not want to make this bad guess. Uh, so, probably let us not do it. So, the idea is that this calculation that people make uh, about what is going to happen if such an event were to occur, basically uh, you know uh, influences and plays a major role in the kinds of decision they would make and the way they would make these decisions. So, let us talk a little bit uh, more about these things. Now, of particular importance to decision making is the fact that whether our judgments about the future are pessimistic or optimistic. Whether we are looking at future in a more positive favorable uh, uh, picture or we are kind of uh, thinking that you know the future is bleak, eh? it is dark, I, I do not think something good is going to happen, I mean uh, I have been suffering and this is this, this is this and I do not think really I am going to come out of it. Now, if these kind of uh, judgments are there, uh, how, how will uh, this really happen? So, people kind of are making these judgments all the time, you know whether I will be happy uh, if this happens, whether I will be sad if this happens, how happy will I be, how sad will I be, all of these kind of judgments, all of these kind of calculations are happening. Now, here comes in the mood state thing. So, the mood states, uh, the mood that you are in uh, certainly influences uh, your attitudes towards uh, risk taking and your attitudes towards predicting the future. So, and this kind of this, this will certainly affect the kind of decision that you will end up making. So, uh, this is this is very important. Now, many people uh, predict that individuals experiencing many researchers, a lot of uh, evidence is there that individuals expressing negative effect will tend to be slightly more pe pessimistic in their judgments uh, and they will be uh, risk averse. So, if you are kind of you know in a very sad state, if you are kind of in a very uh, dejected sort of a thing, you are not really feeling good and somebody asks you what is going to happen, it is kind of likely that you will come up with you know I, I think uh, things are not going to turn better from here. So, uh, they will also be 
in, in that sense because they are kind of uh, thinking that the future is bleak and it is dark and I do not know what is going to happen. They will also be very averse to taking risky decisions. They will not make uh, decisions that could be risky. Uh, and this is this is very interesting because this is kind of uh, in, in some sense that the idea is that if you kind of uh, are in a sad state and you are looking at the future that is going to be sad, it it's kind of is possible that the future is sad because you are not really looking up uh, at other positive uh, possibilities, you are not really opening up. And that is that's, that's just aside from this course because a lot of things that you learn in this course is very important to really apply them in your thought processes and use that knowledge, I mean the kind of research that I am discussing, try and kind of uh, link yourself to it or you know link your lives to it. Uh, coming back, so people have predicted, research has predicted that individuals experiencing negative effect will tend to be more pessimistic in their judgments about the future and they will be risk aversive. In contrast, individuals in positive mood state will be very optimistic about the future, they will be upbeat, upbeat. they will be uh, you know having that kind of confidence to make that leap of faith, uh, they will be having that kind of confidence to take risk and those kind of things. I uh, will come to that positive uh, emotion in risk taking in a lecture later. But um, experimental findings have also shown they found support for these kind of predictions. Uh, obviously, there are uh, in uh, research uh, a lot of times you will come up across with those findings as well which do not uh, fit your hypothesis, but more on that later. Now, uh, let us talk a little bit about uh, the effect of uh, anxiety uh, as one of the emotions on judgment and decision making. Now, anxiety. Uh, I think everybody uh, must have experienced uh, um, different degrees of anxiety at different points in their lives. So, anxiety is associated with concerns and worries about future threats. Uh, people who are anxious are generally kind of fidgety, they are not really, uh, really very uh, confident and sure about what is going to turn out. They are kind of constantly worried, constantly wondering about what is going to happen next. So, Isaac uh, says that anxiety is associated with concerns and worries about future threats and uh, they basically in a recent study in 2006, Ising and colleagues they used scenarios referring to very negative events, you know serious illnesses, uh, deaths and breakups and th uh, those kind of things. And uh, the event in question, they asked them to basically you know uh, they uh, come in uh, encounter scenarios about these events and the events in question could be either a past event that has already happened, think about that, a future possible event that this might happen to you or a future probable event that maybe this will happen. Okay. So, future possible event and a future probable event. Now, participants indicated that they would have experienced more anxiety with the future events occurring both possible and probable than with the past events. Uh, thus indicating in some sense the future orientation of anxiety. People are generally uh, very anxious about the future, what is there in store uh, for me and uh, those kind of things. In contrast, people reported more depression or sadness uh, when they were talking about events that had negative events that had passed on. So, the past negative events kind of provoked some kind of anxiety uh, as a, some kind of sadness as opposed to anxiety. Uh, so, this is this is an interesting contrast between uh, anxiety being more future oriented and sadness in some sense let us say slightly being past oriented. This is, this is a good uh, you know a piece of result that you could uh, you know remember and stick on to. Now, as anxiety involves worrying about future threats, it is not really surprising uh, to find out that it is associated with pessimistic judgments about the future to great extent than any other negative emotion or any other emotional state for that matter. Now, Lerner and colleagues in 2003, they asked participants very shortly after the terrorist attacks of 9-11 to focus on aspects of those attacks that made them uh, afraid, angry or sad. Uh, what happens is what pans out is that the key finding is that those participants who uh, focus on what made them afraid, anxious uh, estimated the probability of the future attacks to be much greater than those participants who focused on the you know that, that were in the other two groups that focused on the other two kinds of things, uh, uh, angry or sad emotions. Now, on the contrary. Uh, and that's uh, that's also a bit interesting. If you look at people around you, most people report uh, at having what is uh, referred to as the optimistic bias. You know, 
uh, with accidents, with uh, you know thefts, with uh, uh, that you know this could happen. Uh, people do reflect what is referred to as the optimistic bias. You know this involves an exaggerated uh, likelihood of positive events happening to them in the near future and minimizing the uh, possibility or uh, likelihood of uh, these uh, uh, negative events. Say, so for example, you know people who are not uh, you know wearing helmets or people who are smoking or drinking. Uh, too much. If you ask them, you know, I mean, there are uh, hazards uh, associated to do these things, and they would most likely tell you that you know this is not going to happen to me. I drive very well. I'm not really prone to uh, falling down or uh, you know, uh, meeting an accident, so on and so forth. And even say, for example, you can take it to any kind of addic addiction that people have. Now, this optimistic bias, uh, you know, seems to occur almost automatically and is still uh, found in people uh, when they are, uh, you know, offered rewards for making accurate predictions. Even when you ask them that, you know, uh, you know, just cut down all this uh, optimism uh, from your uh, uh, judgment and just uh, basically, you know, you, we are going to g give you some reward if you make the most accurate prediction. Even when they are actually consciously trying to make accurate predictions, they would uh, sometimes, you know, reflect this kind of optimistic bias. Now, Lynch and Levine in 2005, they wanted to study the optimistic bias. So, they basically asked college students, uh, you know, whether various positive and negative events were more likely to happen to them than uh, another average college student. And they basically also induced particular kinds of mood states in, the, in these people while they were to make these judgments. Participants that were put into a more fearful mood were found to be much less optimistic about future events than those who were put in a positive mood. So, positive mood people basically or happy or neutral mood people uh, basically uh, uh, did not did uh, show that um, you know optimism thing, uh, but those people who are uh, put in a more fearful mood, anxious mood, they basically they, they were uh, very less optimistic about the kind of future events that might occur to them. Again, uh, you know uh, converging evidence to the one that we were talking. Now, let us talk about the relationship between anxiety and decision making. Anxiety is generally associated with impaired decision making. I mean, you, you would have heard it so many times that you know, you should not really be anxious, do not worry about it so much, just cool yourself, relax yourself and then make this decision. You know, people keep saying all, all sorts of things around you and a lot of times those things are uh, commonsensically uh, so um, uh, clear that even experimental evidence would support that kind of things. Now, uh, Starkey and colleagues in 2008, they found that anxious participants had worse performance than neutral controls on a decision making task that required the use of various executive processes. So, we have referred very briefly to executive process, I think in the bilingualism thing, uh, things like response inhibition, things like shifting of responses, weighing particular responses, controlling things, in, you know, inhibiting particular uh, uh, trains of thought. So, on those tasks, the game of dice were basically, uh, you know, uh, required the use of these executive processes, uh, anxious participants performed much worse. And uh, they actually continued this study, they took this further in 2011 and they actually found that decision making on the task was worse when participants performed an additional task that were also more taxing on their executive processes. So, it, it kind of seems that anxiety is in some way linked to the executive processes uh, as well. Uh, there are various reasons why anxiety could impair decision making, uh, though one of the main reasons is that anxiety impairs the efficiency uh, with which these executive uh, functionings, uh, executive functions are used uh, during the, com uh, you know, during the performance of complex cognitive tasks. So, again more evidence about the fact that uh, anxiety is linked to these various uh, executive uh, processes. So, uh, this is, this is again one of the uh, uh, evidences that says that uh, anxious people will probably be uh, slightly poor or slightly worse in making a uh, particular kind of complex decisions. Also, on the other hand, uh, anxiety has typically associated with avoidance of risky decision making. Anxious people, as I was saying earlier, uh, are slightly pessimistic in their view about the future and in that sense, they are more conservative in making decisions. They would avoid taking risky decisions. Manner and colleagues in 2007, they made use of a computer based uh, balloon task and what they were to do is they were to uh, fill the balloon to an extent uh, that it does not break but then the only the, I mean those people will be rewarded whose balloons were most filled up. Anxious individuals in this task were the most risk averse. They did not take a chance and than the non-anxious ones and they blew up, they generally blew up the bl balloon much lesser to avoid the balloon breaking up. So, again you see another example of them avoiding uh, the, research, uh, the risky scenarios. 
Laurian and Grisham in uh, 2011, they also wanted to study risk taking in patients suffering from various anxiety disorders. So they basically, uh, these patients were made to uh, complete uh, a domain specific risk taking scale and this scale basically consists of around 30 items which assesses the individual's uh, likelihood of engaging in various risky activities. Suppose for example, uh, what is the likelihood that you would, uh, you know, bet uh, your entire salary uh, in a casino? Uh, or what is the possibility that say for example you will go and commit this thing or you will go and do that, uh, all the risk taking scenarios uh, in some sense. Overall what they found was patients with social phobia and generalized anxiety disorder had much lower risk taking scores than the control group or the group which, which was not suffering from any uh, particular emotional disorder. Now, uh, moving slightly further, a very interesting study was done by Raghunathan and Pham in uh, 1999. And what they basically asked was, they asked the participants to decide whether to accept a job A. Now, job A was uh, characterized uh, with very high salary, but low job security. Or job B, which is characterized by average salary, okay, okay kind of a salary, but very high uh, job security. So, participants in an anxious mood state uh, were much less likely, I mean they were much less likely uh, than those in a neutral mood state to choose uh, the high risk job that was job A. The numbers are like uh, only 32 percent of uh, anxious uh, participants chose job A versus 56 percent of uh, neutral mood state participants chose job A. Now, Shiv and colleagues uh, in, a, in a different uh, study around the same uh, topic, Shiv and colleagues in uh, 2005, uh, they wanted to test the hypothesis uh, that people with damage to emotional processing areas of the brain uh, might actually perform better uh, than healthy controls on these gambling tasks. So, they based the, the underlying idea is probably that uh, because anxiety is linked with wondering about the future and wondering about the future is an emotional task. Maybe if there are individuals whose emotional processing is deficient in a particular manner because of brain injury or something, they might be able to actually do the gambling task slightly better. I mean, they will not be so much more worried and stuff like that. Now, these people decided to uh, test the hypothesis in a study involving three groups. So, there was one group who had damage to the emotional processing areas of the brain, amygdala, the orbitofrontal cortex and the somatosensory cortex. And the other group of patients were, uh, one group of patients had brain damage in different areas, but not in the uh, areas uh, concerned with emotion. And then there is this third group with healthy control participants, you know, the intact brain people. Now, participants, uh, this, is a, this is a very interesting task. So, participants are given around dollar twenty to begin with and they are told that, you know, you have to uh, kind of uh, on the basis of the coin flip decide whether or not to invest this dollar one. Now, the idea is that uh, if it came head, uh, they would kind of lose dollar one, but if it came tails, they would win dollar 1.5. So, the idea is if you assume a 50, 50 percent chance, uh, if they are investing 20 out of 20 times, they would still end up gaining 25 cents for each time they have invested, which you can multiply that by 10, giving a 50 percent probability. So, technically the best strategy would uh, for them to would be to basically just go on investing, uh, you know, continuously. Now, as predicted, patients with the brain damage in emotion region, uh, the emotional regions of the brain outperform the two groups. They were not really making any emotional things. They were not really wondering about what is going to happen if I lose this money and stuff. They probably did a very cognitive calculation, a calculative thing and they just performed very well than both the other groups. While all the groups were willing to invest when they had uh, won on the previous hand. So, all the groups, if you have won, it kind of puts you in a temporary emotion, you know, positive emotional state. So, even patients with uh, less emotion, uh, with uh, you know, uh, emo uh, damage to uh, non emotional areas of the brain were willing to uh, bet. Uh, neutral people were, uh, the intact people were willing to bet. And, anyways, the other people were, uh, anyways, willing to bet because they might have worked out those probabilities. Uh, however, uh, the groups uh, differed substantially in their investment behavior if they had lost on the previous round. So, the difference kind of comes that if you have lost something right now, how are you going to appraise the future? Patients with damage to the emotional areas of the brain were far more likely than those in the other two groups to invest in these circumstances as well. So, even if I have lost this hand, even if I lost one dollar right away, but in broad I probably will 
eventually end up winning. So these people who are not really doing any emotional calculation. See, winning and losing is not really only about money. It's also about how you will feel. And people who have these uh, you know intact emotion processing areas, these two groups would probably have engaged in these kind of thing. How bad or good I will feel if I lose. So these people, in that sense, in those calculations, were slightly less likely to make the investment, while these people who have uh, damage, brain damage in the emotional areas of the brain uh, are not really engaging in these kind of emotional uh, counterfactual thinking, and they are just like investing in even those circumstances on whether they have won or whether they have lost in the previous hand. So this is a very interesting result, and it kind of is uh, happening that the you know anxiety created by the loss is deterring the individuals from taking these risky decisions, except in the case of uh, people with brain damage to the emotional areas of the brain. So that is that is again very very interesting in uh, you know in some sense uh, reinforcing uh, thing. Now, uh, De Martino and colleagues did a, a similar study, and they were studying loss aversion in two women, and both of these women had uh, extensive damage to their amygdala. So they are probably uh, deficient at processing and comprehending emotions. Now, the key finding was that neither of the two women uh, showed any evidence of loss aversion. Their emotional processing areas are damaged. There is no sense of loss aversion in them, even if they are losing or winning. They are kind of continuing in the gambling uh, task. As the authors concluded, it seems that amygdala probably acts as a cautionary uh, break. You know, it kind of tells you that this is the permutation combination. This is how you will feel if you win. This is how you will feel if you lose, and you make the judgment. If the amygdala is damaged, nobody is doing these calculations for you, and you're probably you know just going on with your hunch. That, okay, maybe I'll just play again. Maybe I'll play again. So while it kind of establishes that anxiety is associated with risk aversion, the why part is not really very clear. There's there's not a lot of results about why anxiety should be doing this. So there could be two possible factors. First is that yes, an anxious individuals are reluctant to make risky decisions because anyways they are more pessimistic about the uh, you know uh, future than the non-anxious individuals. The other thing is that you know anxiety is an aversive mood state, and so individuals are continuously seeking ways uh, of reducing anxiety. What could be these ways that people look at uh, reducing anxiety? I, there, there's one clue that I will offer, and then you can kind of make uh, these judgments. So it is known that high levels of uh, situational uncertainty uh, increases anxiety. Now the fact is, in uh, betting scenarios or in gambling scenarios, there is obviously this heavy degree of certainty. So what people might be doing is, they might be going with the safest bet when they can predict the outcome very well. They will, if I have not invested, I am 100 percent sure that I am not going to lose. If I am investing, I am not really that sure. So maybe, uh, and uh, you know, there is this, so the notion is maybe these people are trying to make their environments more predictable. A very interesting study was done by Sarinopoulos uh, and colleagues in 2010. They were studying the brain activity indicative of stress and anxiety in response to aversive pictures, you know, unpleasant pictures. There was greater brain activity found when participants were uncertain about whether an aversive picture is going to come next or a neutral picture is going to come. So this uncertainty is showing greater uh, brain activity, regions like amygdala, etc. And this could be one of the reasons why these people are so risk averse, why they do not want to take any risks uh, in, in the first place. So reducing uncertainty is obviously a way of, uh, you know, is possible by making low risk decisions and is it's a really effective way of reducing anxiety. And people who are anxious are constantly, constantly trying to come out of that anxiety. So this is a little bit about uh, how anxiety might be uh, you know, affecting people's decision making. We have uh, done three lectures in the week. Uh, we will continue talking about cognition and emotion in the next lecture.